President Yoon suk yeol and Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida agreed to resume shuttle diplomacy last Thursday as they dined and drank in Tokyo, highlighting the importance of bilateral ties amid regional security concerns and global efforts to bolster supply chains. So how are pundits here assessing the latest summit between Seoul and Tokyo? What has been the response to the summit in neighboring Japan? And how close are the two neighbors to bridging their historical divide? Welcome to Issues and Insiders. Today we revisit the summit between the leaders of South Korea and Japan last Thursday over in Tokyo, during which the two governments sought to renew their ties. For more on this, I have Professor Kim Yonuk from the Korea National Diplomatic Academy. Professor Kim, it's good to see you again. Thank you. I also have Michelle Yehi Lee, Bureau Chief for the Washington Post, live on the line over in Tokyo. Michelle, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you for having me. Right, Professor Kim, how do you assess last Thursday's summit between President Yoon suk yeol and Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida? Well, I think the summit meeting uh, came up pretty quickly, uh, you know, much earlier than I expected. Um, I think this pretty uh, well uh, shows that the, uh, the restoration of two countries' relationship is really, really important for now. Uh, now there, are, uh, there is a Russian invasion on Ukraine and also the rise of China and ongoing North Korea's military provocations. So all these things are making the international uh, situation pretty, you know, pretty much confused. I mean, I think uh, the need for a bilateral relationships and also uh, trilateral cooperation amongst the U.S., uh, Korea and Japan is very important to, to deal with security issues in this region. Right. And Michelle, what has been the general response over there in Japan regarding this latest summit between the two leaders? Right. I hear from many Japanese officials and see in the public polling that people agree that improved bilateral relations and trilateral cooperation in general is a good idea. And there's very cautious optimism about that working out. Uh, you can see that cautious optimism reflected in the polls. Asahi Shimbun just did a poll over the weekend, and 63% of respondents in Japan appreciated President Yoon's visit, and 55% appreciated President Yoon's proposal on the forced labor issue. From the Japanese perspective, you know, the question now is, is this actually going to work out, and is this going to happen? Of staying power. Um, they're highly aware that any solution will need the backing of the Korean public as well as the Japanese public, and they're looking at that very carefully. And I hear from a lot of um, experts in Korea and in uh, experts in Japan-Korea relations who are based in Japan, that President Yoon has gone out on a limb. He is making a politically risky decision and that at the moment he has more to lose and whether Prime Minister Kishida will respond with the corresponding measure. Right. And Professor Kib, Japanese media reported on this Monday that Prime Minister Kishida had called on President Yoon to better tackle the issue of compensation for Korean women who had been forced into sexual slavery during Japanese colonial rule. That being said, back in the year 2015, there was a bilateral effort to better address this particular issue. What were the challenges back then? Um, I think uh, the challenges actually came afterwards. Um, the, during the Park Geun-hye government, um, the foundation was set up, the third party foundation, to compensate for the uh, comfort women. And Japanese government actually uh, set up the endowment of uh, one billion yen, uh, which can be used to, to, for the compensation of, uh, for the uh, comfort women. So that was the first uh, achievement, I think. And second achievement, I think, at the time was that you know, Prime Minister Abe's apology was contained in uh, then, uh, you know, uh, Foreign Minister Kishida's, um, you know, pronouncement. So very clear apologies by uh, Prime Minister Abe was expressed at the time. I think that was very uh, important achievement of the agreement. And but and, and third third uh, point I think uh, is a little bit uh, you know problematic from the South Korean public opinion is that Japanese government at the time you know, pointed out that that agreement is a solution, a final, uh, a final and irreversible solutions of comfort woman issues. So those were the, the I think, the uh, key, uh, key, key contents of the agreement. But afterwards, uh, during the Moon Jae-in government, uh, because uh, of the reason that the agreement did not really reflect much of uh, what uh, comfort women uh, victims are expressing, 
uh, they uh, dissolved the, the uh, third party foundation and, and the agreement itself pretty much was nullified so far. So I think uh, we need to tackle on this. I mean, uh, we might need to talk more with comfort women victims uh, and so that uh, the agreement would be uh, you know, uh, much more effectively uh, you know, implemented in the future. Right. Michelle, speaking within your capacity as a journalist who has been covering the two countries, what are your prospects with regard to the two neighbours' efforts to perhaps better bridge their gap over historical differences this time around? Well, I do think it's a little bit too early to tell because of these issues of credibility and trust and the historical baggage that both countries face when it comes to overcoming these very deeply rooted questions and issues and controversies. Um, as Professor Kim mentioned earlier, Prime Minister Kishida was foreign minister in 2015, and he negotiated the Comfort Women Agreement with the Korean government at the time. So he's not starting from zero, and he has experience working with Koreans, and with that possibly comes um, hope and maybe a little skepticism as well. Uh, the UN administration has clearly wanted improved bilateral relations ever since the campaign trail. President Yoon has talked about this. And we saw during his speech on March 1st uh, on, about the independence movement that it's time to move forward. Uh, he called Japan a partner. Um, when he came to Japan, however, in the press conference, Prime Minister Kishida didn't go as far as calling Korea a partner. He did talk about wanting to improve the friendship and trust between the two countries. Um, however, I do think in a way, the two countries have the right leaders at the right time um, in both countries, as well as in the United States. President Biden is deeply committed to improving uh, alliances and to shore up these relationships and make sure that everyone is working more closely together. Prime Minister Kishida has experience working with the Koreans, and President Yoon wants things to improve. So in one way, all the leaders are in the right place at the right time. Right. Professor Kim, moving forward, Thursday summit has also paved the path to normalizing a key military intelligence sharing pact with Japan, the GSOMIA. That being said, what is your outlook, Professor Kim, regarding Pyongyang's future course of action? Um, I think North Korea's behavior under a very serious and severe U.S.-China competition is a little bit different from the past. Uh, past when U.S. and China was competing each other, North Korea was kind of wavering between two superpowers to maximize its national interest. But now it's a little bit different. I mean, uh, because of COVID and uh, domestic situations, China is not very, uh, which might call it, uh, very, uh, you know, good at, uh, you know, giving aid and support to North Korea. And the U.S. doesn't really care about North Korea. So. During the situation, North Korea, under a very solid North Korea-China relations, continues its uh, military provocations. Of course, uh, uh, at the end of last year, when uh, the Ch China, uh, you know, sent its, uh, you know, surveillance balloon to the United States, uh, before that, the China kind of attempted to expand a cooperation agenda with the United States, but because of the balloon incident, that really didn't happen. So I think for now, what North Korea needs to do now is to continue its military provocations on and on, maybe heighten the level of uh, you know, military provocations in a hope that uh, U.S. or China can do something for North Korea. Uh, which I don't think is uh, really uh, have a very high uh, you know, possibility. But I think for now, uh, North Korea, pretty much on the side of China, uh, speaking for the interests of China, I think is pretty much criticizing uh, you know, South Korea and Japan relationship restorations and, and furthermore would criticize also the bi you know, trilateral cooperations amongst the U.S., South Korea, and, Ch and Japan. You're right. And, and given these regional security concerns, Michelle, is it only natural, perhaps, that Washington welcomes closer ties between Seoul and Tokyo? Yes, I think so. And Korea and Japan are the two biggest allies in Asia of the United States. So I do think it's natural that the United States wants to see improved bilateral ties. I think it's also important to remember that the Biden administration came into this, uh, his leader, you know, the administration, um, 
really wanting to prioritize this because they wanted to show that they're different from the Trump administration. When former President Trump questioned the loyalty of allies, the, uh, the impact of alliances and partnerships, and President Biden wanted to set that straight. On top of that, from the U.S. perspective, uh, they believe that having the two allies get along is the way to increase security cooperation and uh, is critical to a stronger, a stronger trilateral relationship between the three countries. The U.S. believes that it could face geopolitical and economic issues together and to do it together is the better way to go. Um, they want to address China's rise, uh, North Korea's missiles, like Professor Kim said. Um, and on top of that, decreasing the supply chain dependence on China. So the U.S. obviously wants to see uh, a stronger relationship with between the two countries, between Korea and Japan, as well as between the trilateral relationship between U.S., uh, US uh, South Korea and Japan. Right. And staying with what Michelle has just said, Professor Kim, how does closer collaboration among Seoul, Tokyo and Washington look to affect Seoul's relationship with Beijing? Um, I think uh, this definitely affects, uh, you know, China-South uh, Korea relations. But, but before we talk about that, the current uh, U.S.-China competitions and so-called a new Cold War uh, situations systems is something uh, uh, that happens for now. I mean, it's a, from, from the perspective of allies and partners like South Korea, it is a zero-sum competition, which is not... Uh, like the past, I mean, during the uh, Trump government, also Trump, uh, you know, uh, pressured China, but it was not a zero sum. It, uh, Trump did not uh, push allies to to sideline with the United States in pressuring China. But now, the, uh, what Biden is doing is to make uh, the world to be divided between China camp and U.S. camp, and hey, South Korea coming to the U.S. side to to deal with China. So this is something happening now. I mean. Uh, as a one course of actions of the U.S. policy toward China, uh, the Japan and South Korea relationship is restored, which I think will be expanded to the trilateral cooperations, uh, which I think will pretty much in detail to deal with some policies like a decoupling with China on, on, on high-tech industries. Uh, also security issues, um, you know, um, Th these uh, trilateral cooperation will deal with uh, North Korea's provocations too. So I think as this goes by and continues, um, you know, I don't think there is much South Korea can get from China. I mean, we expected China to some roles in denuclearizing North Korea, but China is actually, you know, supporting uh, North Korea at the uh, UN Security Council resolution issues. And Chinese uh, industries, are actually competing with now, now the South Korean companies. Uh, China is not uh, anymore a huge market for uh, South Korean industry that used to be before. So I think, uh, you know, the current trends, I think, would continue in the future uh, in a way that South Korea would not have much to get from China economically. So what can we get from China? Maybe there's not much attraction that we can I uh, expect from China in the future. Right, I see. Moving forward, Michelle, there is talk that the UN administration's latest solution to the issue of compensation for Korean victims of Japan's wartime forced labor may only last until he or his party, that would be the People Power Party, is in power. Is this a general outlook, do you think, among pundits that are in Japan, Michelle? I actually hear this quite a bit in Japan, these concerns about whether the efforts made by the unit administration will stay, whether it has lasting power, staying power, knowing that the government can swing to the other side after his uh, five-year term ends. Um, and especially if the next president is a Democrat who wants to undo what the president, uh, President Yoon did, and then do we have a, a repeat of what we've seen in the past? I hear this quite a bit, and I do think that the switch in governments uh, in Korea, the potential switch in government contributes to the current credibility gap, the perception of whether um, whatever President Yoon is doing will be actually upheld by his successors in the future. Um, and I encounter this sort of skepticism even from people who are hopeful for um, improved relations between the two countries. So I do think it's a big question that President Yoon um, 
um, will have to address moving forward and show to both the Korean public that this is a worthwhile way to go and the right thing to do for the country to do in the long term. And in doing so, he can message to the Japanese that this, that this agreement this time around could face even more of a, you know, lasting possibility even after he leaves office. I think it's important to think about how the swing in governments in South Korea is different from what the Japanese are used to. In Japan, the LDP has been in power for almost continuously for about six decades. And so politics tends to be more incremental, governing tends to be more stable, whereas it's not the case in South Korea. So I think this definitely is an issue that the administration will have to face moving forward. Right. And Professor Kim, what are some of the more immediate tasks, if I may, that need to be tackled as Seoul, Tokyo and Washington seek to strengthen their ties? Um. I'm not, I'm not really sure what are the immediate tasks before they cooperate, but uh, rather I would say what are the key agenda for the cooperations. Uh, maybe the most important and urgent issues for co in three countries is U.S. extended deterrence. I mean, Japan and South Korea simultaneously now feel that the U.S. extended deterrence to each country is not very credible. You know, South Korea, because of uh, North Korea having nuclear weapons and, and undertaking ongoing military provo provocations, now feel that we are unstable. And, and President Yoon suk yeol even mentioned that, you know, South Korea's own, you know, development of its own nuclear weapons, you know, that, that was he, what he mentioned, because that pretty much reflects what South Korea's, you know, current, you know, security situation is about. And, and Japan, the same. I mean, Japanese government now thinks that, um, you know, in the future Taiwan contingency is Japan contingency. And they're worrying about what happens in Taiwan. What if, you know, China uses unstrategic, uh, non-strategic nuclear weapons in case of Taiwan contingency? That will be a directly, you know, uh, have some negative impact on, and, and, on, on Japanese island. And, and, and does the U.S. have any kinds of uh, responsive measures vis-a-vis -vis Chinese possible use of non-strategic weapons? That is some kinds of, uh, you know, concern the Japanese government have. So I think uh, when trilateral cooperation undergoes, I think three countries need to talk about how effectively increase the U.S. credibility of extended deterrence to South Korea and Japan altogether. Right. And Michelle, what are your thoughts regarding the issues of concern between South Korea and Japan as they seek to improve their ties? Right. I think one of the big issues that I'm watching is whether the two sides will keep up this momentum and what that will produce. Um, they could meet and meet and meet, but if it doesn't actually result in the gap closing in any incremental way at all, then I think we'll know the answer of whether this has a prospect of succeeding this time or not. Um, I think making those sorts of gradual, um, even if incremental ways forward, uh, is what we'll be watching in the uh, near term. Um, and the two sides have now agreed to uh, resume shuttle diplomacy. There is, you know, if you look at the calendar, it's clear that they're looking at a sequencing of events to show that they are going to continue talks between the three countries. Uh, President Yoon is going to be going to Washington in April, and then the G7 will be happening in May in Hiroshima. And now there are reports that President Yoon may be invited to um, attend as an observer. And then there are also reports that President Yoon might invite Prime Minister Kishida to Korea in the summer to sort of keep the sequencing event of events going to show that they are continuing dialogue and that it's actually moving forward. Um, I think the issue that President uh, that Professor Kim mentioned is very important in terms of the U.S. Um, showing that it is committed to extended deterrence. We can expect this issue to come up during the uh, U.S. Korea summit dur or during the state dinner um, next month. And I think uh, the other issue that we'll be watching in the immediate term is what the two sides announced last week. They talked about restoring Gisomia. They talked about uh, addressing the export control issue. Um, but they didn't actually say what the timeline of that might be, any sort of details of what those discussions would entail. And that's what we're going to be looking for, those details, and that these meetings are not just to meet, but to actually produce some sort of substance. 
Right. Professor Kim, I've been asking this particular question, this next question that I'm going to address to you, to quite a number of pundits who've been joining us here on our show since last week. Do you believe that South Korea and Japan have much more to gain by moving beyond their painful history and to looking toward a more future-oriented relationship as um, claimed by President Yoon Seok-yeol? Um, okay, I think, uh, you know, uh, what Japanese government is worrying about is that it is still a, not a normal state. You know, uh, being a abnormal state and in the future maybe in 30 years, 50 years, let's assume that U.S. hegemony is very is getting weakened and Japan has to deal with China alone. What is what Japanese people and government would worry about? You know, it doesn't have a constitution that allows Jap Japanese uh, uh, government to fight as a normal state. And I think uh, that's what Japanese government is worrying about. And, and South Korea, too. Uh, let's assume that someday U.S. hegemony is weakened and uh, South Korea is left alone without the United States in East Asia, in the Korean Peninsula. What do we have to deal with it? I think that's something we are worrying about, and that's one of the situations that we need to think hardly about the cooperation with Japan. Right, I see. Michelle, a while back, we had the pleasure of hosting former Japanese Prime Minister Yukio Hatoyama here in the studio. He spoke about the importance of an, a sincere apology first from Japan to South Korea before seeking to advance bilateral ties. That being said, and based on your observations there in Japan, very briefly speaking, uh, Michelle, do you see an apology on the horizon, yet another one perhaps, from Japan to South Korea with regard to its uh, historical aggressions? That is a very, very big question that I think both sides are very interested in. We know that the UN administration is looking for what they've called a quote-unquote comprehensive apology, and yet from the Japanese side, they have stuck with their um, line that they reaffirm previous cabinets um, views when it comes to an apology. And we saw pr uh, Prime Minister Kishida repeat that line last week as well. He said that he upholds the previous cabinet's positions on the apology, but he didn't actually go into what that apology is or didn't reiterate the content of those agreements in the pa um, from the past. Uh, so far, what the Japanese have said does not quite reach the level of what the Koreans want to see. I don't know if uh, we're going to get there anytime soon, but I will definitely be watching to see what sort of apology, um, if at all, uh, actually results from the upcoming discussions. Right, and we will be watching as well. All right, Michelle, thank you so much for your time and your thoughts today. And Professor Kim here in the studio, thank you very much for your insights. Right, well, that ends this edition of Issues and Insiders. Thank you for watching. See you same time tomorrow. That is Tuesday.